if you had been Doctor Who, if you were Doctor Who and you took a trip in your TARDIS back to the year 1500 uh, or 1400, somewhere around about uh, the 15th century, you, you would have been very impressed by Beijing, probably the biggest city in the world at that time, uh, with its clean, wide streets, its dazzling palaces. Uh, you might also have taken a trip on the Grand Canal, connecting it to Nanjing, the older imperial capital. You would have been very impressed by uh, uh, what you might have seen of the Mughal Empire in India. You'd have been dazzled by the achievements of the Ottoman Empire in what is today Turkey. These great oriental empires would have, would have uh, really knocked your socks off. And if you'd had time to take in uh, Peru, uh, you'd have thought the Incas had something quite impressive going on. Uh, and the Aztecs in Mexico too. You'd then uh, take a trip to London and you would have been very underwhelmed uh, by this town because it wasn't a city, it was quite small. And it was very smelly and dirty because the sanitation standards were way lower than, than in Asian cities. Uh, you wouldn't have been that uh, impressed by the architecture because apart from the Tower of London, most of it was pretty rudimentary. Uh, London Bridge was about the most impressive thing there. So you certainly would not have put money at that point on London and other West European cities uh, becoming the dominant uh, entities uh, of the next 500 years. Something happened that empowered the ramshackle little monarchies uh, of Western Europe uh, to become the masters of the world. The economic masters, the technological masters, the political masters. Something made these little countries, they were little countries, Portugal, uh, England, the Netherlands, and then the somewhat bigger Spain and France. Something empowered these countries and enabled them over a period of time to establish mastery over the much larger empires uh, of the East as well as over the entire New World, as they called it, the, the Americas. And so I've been asking myself a lot for the last few years what that was. And the course that I've been uh, teaching recently at Harvard had the title Western Ascendancy, Mainsprings of Global Power, which is a somewhat bombastic title, but gets to the heart of the matter. What was it that made the West dominate the rest? Why were the Westerners superior to the Resterners, if you will forgive that phrase? And I, I've come to the conclusion that there were really six killer applications, killer apps, that uh, originated in the West, which it took ages for the rest of the world to download. And for the sake of brevity, I'll tell you uh, what the six uh, were. Imagine bullet points. Uh, so number one was competition, uh, both political and economic. D to talk about capitalism misses the point that, that Western Europe also had phenomenal competition between multiple institutions in the political sphere too. Autonomous cities you really didn't find in, in the great Asian empires. But the fact that London was a semi-autonomous city in uh, medieval England and that within London there were multiple corporations uh, and guilds representing different crafts uh, was really a very distinctive feature of that society. It was partly a consequence of the weakness of royal authority, that there was no emperor in Europe as powerful uh, as, as the Ming Emperor in China. Charles V tried and ultimately failed to establish a monopoly on power. So competition is part of the story unquestionably. The scientific revolution that happened in the 17th century was killer app number two. Uh, Newton uh, had no peer, no competitor in the Eastern world, much less in the Americas. Although the Asian empires had mathematics to a very high level uh, and astronomy, though that sometimes blurred into astrology, they just didn't do the scientific revolution. and They were effectively offline when the scientific revolution happened, uh, as it did in, in, in Western Europe with some traffic to North America. Number three killer app. Uh, well, one might say democracy, but I think that would be wrong because most Western political institutions were not democratic in the strict sense until relatively recently, late 19th century, early 20th century. It's more that an idea of citizenship based on property ownership and representation took hold, first in the English-speaking world and then it, it spread. Uh, John Locke was in many ways the great theorist of this relationship between property and representation. 
And the idea of some property-owning representative government uh, spread from uh, England to North America and in the United States found its most perfect form. When this became democratic, when the franchise was extended to non-property owners, uh, democracy was much more likely to work where that foundation existed. It was the rule of law in a system where the law was made by property owners through a representative assembly. So that's killer app number three. Number four is modern medicine. Uh, one, once the West figured out what caused cholera epidemics uh, or why plague spread or what tuberculosis was, uh, it had a huge advantage over the rest. Uh, and so in the late 19th century into the 20th century, there's a revolution in uh, human life expectancy, which is entirely the result of advances in the realm of medicine. And the great empires of the late 19th century and early 20th century used this knowledge uh, to good effect, but also in a somewhat uh, brutal way because inseparably allied with these medical advances uh, was a pseudoscience of race that essentially legitimized Western imperial power by asserting that non-Western peoples were subordinate forms of humanity. Uh, that's the shadow side of this story I'm telling, which I want to emphasize because this is not a triumphalist story, it's an exercise in comparative history. Killer app number five is the consumer society, the idea that everybody should have more than one set of clothes. And that sounds rather banal, unless you're a teenager, in which case you immediately get it. Uh, but, but it's hugely important. What, once you have uh, a clothing at the heart of your economy, textiles, textile factories, uh, which were the key to the Industrial Revolution in England and everywhere else, uh, you need consumers too. And the big difference between spices and clothes, uh, spices were the basis of the Dutch East India Company's business, uh, and clothes textiles were the basis of the British East India Company's business, is simple. The demand for cloves and spices like nutmeg is finite. Uh, it's quite inelastic. There's only so much uh, that you can consume a year. The demand for clothing is infinitely elastic. Uh, the, there is never enough in your wardrobe, uh, in, in, it seems to be, in most uh, human lives. And so textiles and the Industrial Revolution that accompanies the spread of the consumer society uh, really uh, represents killer app. Uh, number five. And finally, uh, Max Weber had a brilliant idea about a hundred years ago, a little bit more, uh, that there was a Protestant ethic that generated the spirit of capitalism. Now, I think he was sort of half right about that because a work ethic clearly was something that differentiated the West from the rest for much of the period I'm talking about. Uh, where he was probably wrong was attributing this exclusively to Protestantism because it turns out that many, many different religious cultures can get that work ethic. Jews had it roughly contemporaneously with Calvinists. And nowadays, of course, what we see is that work ethic spreading uh, into all kinds of different civilizations, most notably the Confucian civilization of China. So the argument is a six-part argument. There are six killer apps that give the West predominance over the rest over about 500 years. And the final question, of course, is, is it over? Uh, is this the end of Western ascendancy? And it seems quite plausible to think that it is, because after all, these killer apps are no longer mon monopolized by the West. The rest basically have downloaded them all. Uh, to varying degrees, but with a pretty high uh, degree of success. And that means it's unlikely that the West will continue to occupy that position of extraordinary predominance that it had, say, 100 years ago, when maybe 20% of people in the world lived in Western empires, Western societies, uh, but they accounted for more than 50% of all global income. I think that that's pretty much coming to an end now. Mm -hmm.